It's episode 668 of the Locked On Rangers podcast. On today's show, breaking down a Rangers sweep at the hands of the Astros, Jack Leiter turning a quarter, and a look ahead to this weekend's series in Boston. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers, your daily Texas Rangers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, founder and host for all four seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Thursday, September 1st. Your Rangers are 58 and 71. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Bryce Patrick. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers and subscribe on YouTube, where the best way you can help grow the, grow the show is to comment any single thing below. Today, we're going to get into... Josh Young not making his debut. We're going to get into a little bit of talk about Jack Leiter, about this series against the Astros, and a look ahead at this weekend series in Boston. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Vroom. With Vroom, you can buy a car entirely online and have it delivered straight to you so you never have to go to a dealership again. So next time you need to buy a car, just grab your phone, go to Vroom.com, and check out thousands of great cars. Now, let's just go ahead and get the bad news out of the way. Let's just get it out of the way right now because it, we're not going to see Josh Young. We are just not going to see him today, and I, I, I don't know that we're going to see him for another eight days, at least at the Major League level. If you're in Round Rock, celebrate, congratulate yourself, or if you're in any of the cities where Round Rock is playing this week, uh, celebrate, congratulate yourself, buy a ticket to go watch Josh Young in the minors because he should not be there for much longer. At this point, the rosters have expanded. The Rangers have not made really any roster moves today that they have announced at this point as I'm recording at 3.13 p.m. Central Time. Of course, I waited I waited and waited until we got the lineup for this series against Boston because I thought, okay, Roster to expand. You're not going to DFA anybody. You're not going to make any life-altering decisions, which they're probably going to have to DFA some people. Anyway, um, okay. Now, literally, as I'm recording this, 22 seconds ago, they have made some roster moves. Josh Spores has been transferred from the 50-day IL to the 60-day IL. Jesus Tinoco's contract has been selected from Round Rock, and Nick Solak has been recalled from AAA. So, again, very definitively not Josh Young <laughs> coming up. And it seems like it's at least it's going to be at least a week. The Rangers don't go home until another eight days. Next Friday, they will start a home series against the Toronto Blue Jays. And I would think, surely, 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 at that point, they would call up Josh Young because at this point, his his offensive numbers are not as insane the last like three games as they were for the first twelve. Which again, hitting six home runs in your first twelve games up at Triple A after what a week at Arizona, uh, the complex league that that's pretty darn impressive. The bat is obviously there. He is lacing doubles to left, right, and center, lacing home runs left, right, and center, singles, everything. He is walking. Um, the only thing that is really there, the only thing that is left to be gained is some continued reps at third base. The throws have been accurate, but uh, according to some people who have been watching his games more closely than I have, there have been some defensive miscues. Just getting him more reps, getting him more healthy, sure that he is going to play every day at third base. But I think that's what this indicates, why they're waiting so long, is that he is going to play every day third base once he gets called up. Now, what does that mean for Ezekiel Duran? I'm not entirely sure. He doesn't deserve to get sent down. He probably could do with some, some more time in AAA, get a little bit more of his positional feet under him in the outfield, which I think might end up being where he is long-term. Maybe he fits in left field. Maybe Josh Young fits at third base or maybe vice versa. I think defensively I've talked about it over and over and over again, but I think Josh Young might end up be more likely if they're going to go prioritize defense. If they're going to do that, then Ezekiel Duran obviously has the upside. He has been doing really well defensively at third base and at pretty much every single infield position he has played so far. Um, and that might end up leaving Josh Young in left field, which I think he'd be fine at. He is a baseball rat. He works his tail off. And, you know, I think wherever he goes, he will end up being just fine. But that is your Josh Young update. We'll get to a Jack Leiter update later on. He had another really great start. We'll talk about what that means. But 
We got to get into this stupid, stupid Astro series. I very stupidly, why why would I say that the Rangers could ever do any nice thing against the Astros? Because that's just not been true for the last three, four, five years. Outside of that one Martin Perez start, pretty much everything against the Astros has been absolute doggy dookie crap, miserable poop throw up. That is about as accurately as I can say it. And that's kind of what this series felt like a little bit. Right when the Rangers felt like they were doing anything, anything in this one. They got to Christian Javier making throw over 30 pitches in that first. And you thought, okay, okay, maybe they can get to Christian Javier in this one. No, 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 they can't. They can't get to him. Five innings, three runs, three walks, seven strikeouts against this Rangers squad. Even though he did let up that massive, massive Corey Seager Two-run shot his 29th of the season in that first inning. Marcus Simeon reached base on a walk, and then bada-bing, bada-boom, he stole second base. 2020 season for Marcus Simeon, the first time in his career. The first time the Rangers have had two different players with 2020 season. That's 20 homers, 20 stolen bases since 2009 when Ian Kinsler, and I'll let you take a guess if you haven't seen it on Twitter already, you know who it is? It's Nelson Cruz. That's right. Remember Nelson Cruz used to steal bases? He used to be young and spry once. He wasn't always 43 like he is right now. He wasn't always, a, well, he kind of always probably was a, a DH in waiting, um, including uh, some of the, even his younger years, but he was still in his 20s and early 30s. But that is a cool, fun stat for him. Literally, the first pitch is when he took off. He's like, I want this 2020 season off my back. You've been stuck on 19 for a while. Had not had a lot of stolen bases in his career previously, but this was the year where he finally did it. His career high uh, four stolen bases was 15. That was last year in Toronto. Was not having a lot of stolen bases in Oakland or with the White Sox the two seasons he was up with them. But the Rangers have let him run ham on the bases. They've let everyone run ham on the bases. And that was a nice moment for him. But other than that, there was not a, light, not a lot of nice moments for this Rangers squad. It was, again, Nathaniel Lowe getting back to his crushing ways, absolutely annihilating it. Reached base every single time. A single, a double, and a pair of walks. An 850 OPS hitting 301 at this point. He got back off of a rough game against a very tough lefty in from Rivaldez. Uh, in the game before, and it looks like Nathaniel Lowe is back to his ways. And with a guy who uses the entire field, I am looking forward to seeing what he does at Fenway, see if he can hit some home runs over the monster in left field or hit a couple doubles or just mash him to that incredibly deep center field because he has got that kind of power and he is tapping into every single bit of it. But a guy who has pitched very powerfully this season did not have a great outing, Martin Perez. This was one of his rougher outings on the season. We're going to get into that. And another pitcher who actually had a really, really great day that very desperately needed it. Needed it. But first, I've got a special message for y'all. Are you one of those people who thinks it's okay to drive stone? What's the worst that could happen? You end up driving below the speed limit? That's no big deal, right? Wrong. The truth is, your reaction times slow way down when you're high. You not only put yourself in danger, but every single person around you. Talk about a buzzkill. Stop kidding yourself. It is not okay to drive high. If you've been using marijuana in any form, do not get behind the wheel. If you feel different, you drive different. Drive high, get a DUI. Now, let's look at Martin Perez's line from this game. This was just... Martin Perez trying to work around way too many base runners and not that he was intentionally giving them up. That makes it sound like he was just like, hey, you get on base, you get on base, you get on base. Let's see if I can get out of this just to challenge myself. No, no. The Astros are just a really good hitting team and they were putting together a great offensive day against him. He went five innings, nine hits, five runs, all of which were earned four walks and five strikeouts. Now, getting a strikeout printing is nice, especially against this Astros team that doesn't really strike out a whole, whole bunch. But Giving up nine hits in five walks is just not a recipe for success. Did not give up a home run. The only extra race he gave up was to Jose Altuve, his 31st double of the season. But gosh, Jose Altuve has just been on a freaking tear. The Rangers are very glad to not see him for a whole f four days. And then they head to Houston, play three games against him and the Astros there. And then they're finally done with this wretched Astros team for the year. There's caused them nothing but trouble. In this game, Jose Altuve just crushed everybody. This entire series, he crushed everybody. He went two for three with a double and a single and a pair of walks in this game. Just was on fire this entire week. 
just not a great time to see Jose Altuve, which, in my opinion, there's never really a great time to see Jose Altuve. But he torched the Rangers in this one. Um, Dennis Santana is the guy who I talked about having a much, much needed solid performance. He is coming off back-to-back really solid outings. His, one of his first games back was against Colorado on the 24th. He went, he got one out. He allowed five hits and allowed four earned runs. He at least he didn't walk anybody. He was throwing strikes. They were very hittable strikes, but hey, they were strikes. And in the last two outings, he has allowed a combined one hit, two walks, and struck out seven in three and two-thirds innings. That is exactly what the Rangers want from him. He has not been a big strikeout guy, despite having really nasty raw stuff. He has had some issues with the walks. Only one walk in two innings and one hit without any runs was a solid, solid performance against this dangerous Houston Astros lineup. The Rangers are, I think he's right on the on the verge of who the Rangers are going to be able to confidently say this is going to be a member of our bullpen next year. He has shown long stretches of dominance. He had a an ERA as low as 133 on the season. That was all the way back on, let's see, that was June 21st. He had a, uh, even 129 was his lowest ERA. And that was his last outing against the Phillies. And then it got a little bit worse after a, an outing against the Nationals, and then continued to skyrocket in a really terrible month of July where it was a 5.43 ERA in that month. So far this month, it's been a 9.0 ERA in five outings. Really only been two rough starts. Three out of the five outings he's had have been solid and scoreless. Two of those five outings have been one or more innings, or more than one innings, I should say, against Detroit and Houston for those two outings, but he's looked a lot better in these two outings, starting to feel like himself again coming off that IL, and uh, the Rangers really, really need him to be at his best because having he's about, I'd say, the fourth or fifth guy in this pen at this point moving forward, maybe fifth or sixth. Honestly, it might end up being fifth or sixth, but you have Jose Leclerc, you have Jonathan Hernandez, you have Brock Burke, and you have Matt Moore, and then I think Dennis Santana slots in right around there. He will he would be you know about, about even with Brett Martin or some of these other guys later on in this bullpen, but again, he has been fairly consistent for the year outside of those two months where it was just I feel like he was trying to pitch through injury a little bit too much, or I don't really know exactly what the case was, or maybe he was just doing things wrong, and that's why he got injured. I don't really know. Maybe it was fatigue. He was used a whole lot. Same with Brett Martin. When both those guys had their big blow-up months of July, they were just completely overtaxed because the Rangers didn't have much from uh, these two guys in John Hernandez and the clerk coming back off the I.L., but... Enough about Major League Pitching. Let's look a little bit about Minor League Pitching. Jack Leiter is coming off another really, really solid performance against Amarillo in Amarillo, which is a difficult place to pitch. Um, But he is coming off one of his better starts of the season. He went five innings total, ended up giving up more runs than he should have. Two, Two runs, both of which were earned. One was allowed on a ground out from uh, Jordan Lawler who was beating out a double play out running on the corners, was 0 for 3 against Jack Leiter. Also, just want to want to point out that Jordan Lawler was my pick, and it seemed like Jack Leiter was the pick because the Rangers wanted somebody who was pitching. They drafted for need, and they drafted for a guy who could, you know, soar through the system and might end up making a difference on the big league club sooner as opposed to later. And he was a very polished college pitcher, and he's probably going to be back in double next year, which is fine and great, and I'm not saying it's the wrong pick. But I'm also saying that Jordan Lawler is a high school pick who is already in double A, even though he missed a decent chunk of time last year with a shoulder injury. He's already in double A. I'm just saying, maybe maybe I was right about the Jordan Lawler pick. Maybe. Not to show any shade on Jack Leiter, who, by the way, I started this segment to encourage him. He came out after that fifth inning into the sixth inning looked like he might be able to get one more inning of work and tie his career high of six innings which he's only reached once he's had five and two innings five and two thirds innings a couple of times out but he allowed back to back to back base runners a single and uh, i believe one walk yeah the only only one walk in this one he was without a walk through five innings only had that one run only a couple of base runners and i thought okay 
well, I think he was at 76, 77 pitches. At that point, you thought, okay, maybe he's got enough for one more outing. I think he threw over 90 pitches in his in the outing before this where he went five and a third innings and struck out eight, tying his career high. But I thought, mm, maybe you pull him up to this just so you can continue to build all that and say, hey, all right, you got it. But also you got to be in the mindset of, okay, well, you're going to have to pitch through fatigue at the big league level. You do have a decent workload under your belt for the season. Maybe, maybe, maybe you want to keep him learning how to pitch through all that. He ended up with a line of five innings, six hits, two runs, both earned one hit by pitch, one walk, and five strikeouts. It was fairly efficient with his pitch count was going after guys, but the big thing is that he is now throwing all five of his pitches and throwing them fairly confidently. He's not throwing the cutter a whole, whole bunch. He really just started using that. This year, he's throwing the change up more often. Still not a lot, which is not a pitch that he is going to have to use a whole bunch. He even th- I believe he threw a change up righty-righty, which is not a thing that happens a whole lot, but he's found his curveball. I talked about this a few episodes ago, but that is a huge, huge development for him. In college, he was pretty much a fastball curveball guy. The curveball was miles ahead of the slider. He's felt more comfortable with the slider this year, had a better feel for it. It has been his primary non-fastball pitch, but the thing that made him so dangerous is that he could throw the curveball in fastball counts. He could throw it oh-oh. He could throw it first pitch and start you on the knees. I think one of, if not the first batter that he threw against in double-A, he started him off with the first pitch, a curveball for a strike. And everyone thought, what? What? That's nuts. If he can locate that curveball in the strike zone, use it as a chase pitch as well. And he can do the same thing for his slider and get a little bit better of a feel for that fastball command. Oh, boy. Then you start talking about the cutter, who his dad, if you know anything about his dad, threw a heck of a cutter. And it wasn't Mariano Rivera, but it was really darn good enough to keep him in the big leagues for 20 years. And then you had a changeup as well. You got five pitches, three of which could end up being double plus pitches. And you have two more that are, you know, average. Or if, if one of those, if the cutter or the changeup ends up being a plus pitch and the others end up living up to their potential, good Lord, this guy is dangerous. He's going to make me look stupid forever, even implying that he shouldn't have been the right pick. He has made some serious progress. It has been the overall numbers for the year are not great, but he's got 84 innings under his belt, 99 strikeouts. The stuff has been there. He has learned how to fight through adversity. He has fought through some struggles and figured some things out, and he is finding his stride towards the end of the year and not fading down the stretch. That is an encouraging, encouraging thing. All you can ask for is for your prospects to learn and grow at each level, and he is definitely learning and growing, and I am very encouraged by his progress in this last month. He's got maybe one or two starts left in the season. Maybe those will end up being his best outings. Maybe he'll continue to have that feel for the curveball improve and just absolutely make some guys look silly at double A. But making that top prospect 0 for 3 in Jordan Lawler, that was that was no small feat. And I know, I know that he had some extra oomph for that young kid. But coming up, we're going to take a look at this Red Sox series and why I'm a little scared of the Rangers not having a starter listed for Saturday's game. But first, this word from our sponsors. Now, let's look at the pitching matchups in this one. Start on Thursday night, we have Glenn Otto versus 87-year-old Rich Hill. On Friday, we have Dallas Keuchel versus Nick Pavetta. On Saturday, we have the vaunted TBD going for the Rangers versus Brian Bellow. And on Sunday night's game, we have Dane Dunning versus Cutter Crawford. By the way, Cutter Crawford actually does have a cutter. I was looking that up because I thought it is spelled with a K. Cutter is this cutter's name. And I thought if this guy doesn't have a cutter and his name is Cutter, then what in the heck are we doing? Cutter Crawford is a guy who was drafted out of Florida Gulf Coast in the 16th round. He's a 26-year-old right-handed pitcher. He has just not been super great this year. You look at his baseball savant page, there's a whole lot of blue, which is bad. It's generally not great. He does have a cutter that he throws 31% of the time, the next most behind his fastball, which averages 95 miles an hour. He's got a pretty good spin rate on that fastball in the top 10% of spin rate, and I believe it is a four-seamer, so that is encouraging, and 90 for for him, not for Rangers. He's got decent strikeout percentage and whiff percentage in the top half of baseball. 
Um, it's kind of wild to see his fastball velocity is in the 26th percentile, even though he averages 95 miles an hour with his four-seamer. Maybe they're adding that cutter in there, which averages 89 miles an hour, and that's bringing it down because he throws that cutter quite a bit. But the extension, the curveball spin rate, the other things like that, not super great. The cutter is a super effective pitch for him this year, so the Rangers might be able to match up well in that game. But TBD is leaving me some... Some serious concern. Maybe it's going to be Jesus Tinoco who just got called up. Maybe it's going to be an outsider. Um, there was some uh, back and forth um, from some of the Rangers beats asking Tony Beasley who that TBD is going to be, and Beasley is being very coy and not not saying exactly who it was going to be. And after that discussion, I saw a tweet from, I believe it was uh, MLB Trade Rumors, that Ross Detweiler elected free agency, and my God, if the Rangers go get Ross Detweiler, I'm going to lose my freaking mind. If that is the if that is the TBD, then I am going to absolutely lose my freaking mind. The Rangers have done the Ross Detweiler experiment. They have done it. It has not gone well. I would not like to see the Ross Detweiler experiment again. No, thank you. I have seen enough of it. He has played for 800 years, approximately. It's been a long, long time. It pitched for the Rangers. Gosh, it's been so long. 2015 was when he pitched for the Rangers. Um, I can't remember if he went there before or after uh, Atlanta, but I know he pitched in both those places that year. And the time that he was in Texas in 2015 as a 29-year-old, which was just so long ago, he pitched in 17 games. Seven of those were starts. He finished off four of those games, had a 7-12 ERA in 43 innings, 28 strikeouts, 20 walks, nine home runs. Just not great at all. Only two homers per nine, uh, less than six strikeouts per nine, more than four walks per nine. Those are not the kind of numbers you are looking for. He has pinched pitched for Cincinnati this year out of the bullpen has not started I don't believe he started yeah no games this year no games at all a 444 ERA in 30 games 26 and a third innings with Cincinnati the last time he started a game was for Miami in 2021 he is now 36 years old just please don't subjugate me to some Ross Detweiler action. Now, the Boston Red Sox have a half-decent team, but they are in last place in the American League East. The team that my stupid butt picked to finish first in this division is now at the very back end. I said, yeah, I trust I trust this starting staff. I trust them to, you know, to hold up and do well. And you know what? No. No. The, the best pitcher, the lowest ERA for anybody with more than, I believe, 10 starts. I don't know how many starts they got ended up getting from chris sale okay yeah chris sale got two starts and then he had season ending injury which is not great for them i thought he would come back a little bit sooner and also pitch more than two games for them but that was not the case nick vetta has fallen back a little bit this this year nathan eovaldi is on the il at this point the 15 day il not the 60 day il and the most effective pitcher for them has been michael walker who did pitch last night the rangers are not going to face him through 17 games he's got 95 innings under his belt a 256 era they are coming off a I believe it was a win against the Twins in Minnesota. They're heading back home. Offensively, we know they are powered by the two big, big engines in Xander Bogarts and Rafael Devers, two of the best offensive players in all of baseball this season. They're probably going to lose Xander Bogarts to free agency because they are cheap, and that is what the Red Sox do. Despite being a big market team, not being willing to spend, we saw it with Mookie Betts. At least they traded Mookie Betts at the deadline and got, well, something for him. Not a whole lot, but they got something for him. Alex Verdugo has been fine this year, and that's the best part of that trade. Seven home runs for him, a 729 OPS, but Xander Bogarts has a 836 OPS, which is 33% better than the average. Shortstop Rafael Devers has an 873 OPS at third base and 25 bombs on the year. Um, that is 40% better than the average third baseman. Christian Vasquez was doing really well. They traded him to the Astros, which was honestly quite rude. Jackie Bradley Jr. is... Uh, not doing well offensively this year, which, you know, is to be expected. J.D. Martinez is just having a fine year for his standards. 13% better OPS than the average DH, with which is 768. 11 home runs for him this year. Trevor Story has been fine. 
It's been about average, and if you were wanting him to be the second baseman as opposed to Marcus Simeon, their numbers are fairly comparable. A 727 OPS for Story this year, a 709 OPS for Marcus Simeon. Simeon has 20 home runs on the year, and Trevor Story has 15 home runs on the year. I'm pretty sure he got like half of those home runs in a week or a week and a half span when he was just hitting home run after home run after Grand Slam for that week where he ended up winning an AL Player of the Week award. Other than that, has not been super great. He also had a really rough start to the season. He's only played in 85 games this year, and, well, Marcus Simeon has played in 128 games, so about 43 more, if my math is correct. Other than that, offensively, there's just not a whole lot going on. I mean, some of the fringe players, Kike Hernandez, who had a really great offensive season last year, has an OPS below 650 this year. Alex Verdugo, again, a 729 OPS on the year. Trevor Story, we just talked about. Bobby Dahlbeck has not been super great at first base. An OPS of 644, which is 21% worse than league average first baseman. They're starting pitching. Like I said, Nick Pavetta taking a step back. Ivaldi, Rich Hill has been fine. Just under 90 innings, 432 ERA. Cutter Crawford, a 547 ERA on the season. And Nick Pavetta, a 440 ERA in 147 innings this season, was significantly better than I thought he would be last year. Took a step back, kind of showed that was a little bit of an outlier year. Their bullpen hasn't been super great. Tanner Hawk has been their closer, but he is on the IL. Austin Davis has a 547 ERA, and he has the one of the top, I think the third most bullpen appearances for this team. Um, John Schreiber... Don Schreiber, Schreiber, one of those two, has been fairly effective out of the bullpen in 52 and two-thirds innings, has five saves, has a 222 ERA. Not a whole lot of save opportunities because this Red Sox team has not been in all that many close games. Actually, their save leader is Tanner Huck. Huck, Hauk, I'm not exactly sure which one of those two it's pronounced, but he's got eight saves on the season. That's their save leader. That's not a super encouraging stat, but then again, the Rangers save leader is Joe Barlow at 13 saves, but the Rangers have a significantly worse record, and, you know, they should have had significantly lower expectations than this Red Sox team. They're still a feisty club. They still have those two incredible bats. Trevor Story is a really, really talented player. J.D. Martinez is still a really talented player. So is a lot of the rest of this lineup, but it has been just a rough year for this Red Sox team, not quite living up to the hype, making some weird trades at the deadline. They made a trade for Tommy Pham, who confused me at the time, but he's he's been, he's been fairly consistent for them. In 25 games, for the Red Sox this year, Pham has an 811 OPS. Reese McGuire, who I'm not sure if he was called up at around the deadline or if he was traded for. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he was traded for from Chicago. I'm not sure, exactly sure how that trade went down, but he has been consistent for them at the catching position. 881 OPS in just 17 games. He has been decent behind the plate. And uh, yeah, other than that, it's just not a whole lot of consistently... Fr- consistency from this Red Sox squad. They are they are coming off a win against the Twins. They are fighting for their playoff lives. I don't think they really have that much of a hope of crawling past all of the teams that they need to crawl past. Um, but it's still, they're going to be fighting hard every single day. It's going to be a difficult four-game series. Boston is always a tough place to play, always have some really, really intense fans, but it is they are still pretty far out of that wild-card spot. Yes, let's see. Eight games behind the wild-card spot. They are uh, only three, let's see, three, four, four games better than the Rangers. They have uh, three fewer losses and five more wins on the season. So, again, they've been a pretty similar record to the Rangers and for a team that so much was expected from and they did so well last year to fall off this much is really, really tough place for them to be in right now. They have several teams in between them and that third wild card, which is currently held by Toronto. Baltimore is in front of them. Minnesota and the White Sox are both in front of them. So they're going to have to pass all of those teams to get into the wild card, which they are eight games behind in this final ish final full month of the season, there'll be a couple games in 
August, October, I should say. But they're in a rough spot. They might just be straight up despairing because their playoff hopes are done. There's going to be not a lot of changes coming up. Alex Cora has been vocally supported by ownership despite having such a rough season from this team. They've had some bad injury luck. They still have two of the best hitters on the freaking planet. They're probably going to lose one for nothing next year, which is going to be hilarious for all those who like laughing at Boston sports and deeply depressing for all those who love Boston sports. But that's what to expect for this weekend. I'm excited to see what the Rangers can do in this opener. We'll see what Glenn Otto can bring and how much longer we have to wait for Josh Young. I am eagerly anticipating the day where I can finally properly freak out for Josh Young being called up. But the day is not that day. This weekend is probably not going to be that day. So let's just enjoy watching some games at Fenway and slightly earlier baseball. That's going to do it for this edition of Locked On Rangers. Thanks again for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. Now, for your second listen, go check out the Ultimate Pro Football Preview for 2022, an eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season, which is coming up real soon. The local team experts of the Locked On Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Locked On Bets, all coming to you in one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. That'll do it for today's show. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball.